just putting your if you don't mind just putting your uh, name in there as a participant, that would be awesome. And um, I'm really terrible at taking notes and talking at the same time. So please uh, feel free to just type notes. Um, the, the document was sort of advertised as an agenda, but really it's kind of an agenda slash notes document. So, um, so feel free to take notes in there. And if you want to, uh, emphasize something as being a addition by a particular person just put it in the text as read or something um please don't put it in his comments because i'll just um make a pdf of this and then the comments don't show up and i have to transfer them so just type directly in the document please uh okay so um let's see Am I in the right document? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Um, so I have on here suggested uh, January 9th as our next meeting. Um, and the time that we've been meeting at is 1300 UTC, which I recognize is really horrible for people in Australia. And there's one person in Australia who <laughs> did tell me she was hoping to attend. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I guess at this point, I'm going to, out of inertia, going to suggest that we just keep the same time, but we'll, we'll see how much of an interest there is from people for whom that time zone doesn't work and we may need to adjust that. Does anybody have any thoughts about the date or the time for the next meeting? All right, if, if not, we will just tentatively uh, go for that date. So welcome everyone. And uh, this is um, a special meeting of the technical architecture group that is um, a part of the Tadwig working sessions. So hopefully we will have a lot of new people who, ha who have not previously attended a TAG meeting. And I will just say at this point, the TAG meetings are are always open. They're not just open to members, they're open to anyone who um, is interested to participate. And typically the meetings are announced in the TAG uh, GitHub site. So let me at this point go ahead and I'm going to share my screen. Oops, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, I got that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And what I would like to do is take a few moments and just kind of talk about what the tag is and um, what we've been doing for the last year. So can someone verify that they're seeing my screen? Okay, great. Okay, so on this first slide here, I have put the tag GitHub page. The tag GitHub page um, is the place, oh, sorry, taskbar in the way. Um, the tag GitHub page is kind of where we keep all of our stuff. So if you want to know who the tag members are, all their contact information, it's on this landing page. Also, the uh, notes from all of the previous minutes are also listed in here. So if you have any question about what we've been doing, and this is also the place where we stuff things like documents that we develop and things like that. So this is kind of the go-to place for um, things relating to the tag. Uh, also, I should say that uh, you're welcome to uh, unmute and ask questions if you have any. I also um, have the chat open, and I'll try to uh, keep an eye on that um, if anybody has any questions they want to put in the chat. So I will start by saying that the tag is an example of a functional subcommittee. Um, these are a little bit different from the regular uh, task groups and working groups in the sense that they are permanent and they're established um, by as a part of the Tadwig constitution. So the um, chair of the sub of the um, functional subcommittees is an elected position, although frequently they are elected by being unopposed, as was the case for me, because it's often difficult to get somebody to do it. Uh, but it is an elected position, and the chair of the functional subcommittees are also um, members of the executive committee. So I participate 
and, and so that allows me to kind of liaise with the executive committee about what things we're doing in the tag. Um, ben Norton, who is here, is our, uh, are you deputy chair? I forget what the title, sub deputy chair, I think is the title. Um, and then, as I said before, there's a list of people who are tag members. There is a limit in the constitution for the number of members on the uh, functional subcommittees and and the chair is supposed to appoint members. So pretty. So my um, feeling about this is basically trying to recruit people who represent different um, constituencies within TADWIG. Um, that could be interest groups, task groups, um, uh, big uh, aggregators and things like that. So um, the tag mostly operates on consensus. I don't, I can't remember whether we've actually ever voted on anything or not. So whether you're an official member of the tag or not, I think the main distinction there is whether you can vote or not, but since we've never actually voted on anything, um, the main uh, thing is showing up. <laughs> so um, let's, I, I guess I'll move from talking about sort of uh, the administrative position of the tag to what it is exactly the that the tag is supposed to be doing. So I kind of pulled these out of our charter and other documents. The main thing that the tag is supposed to be doing is basically to advise the executive committee. And sometimes the executive committee will actually ask us for advice about something. Uh, for example, there is a, a charter of a new task group and we were asked to take a look at that. The other thing is that when standards, new standards or additions to standards are moving through the pipeline, um, the TAG is also asked to do sort of like a, a technical evaluation of those proposals. So we do that sometimes. The other thing is to just kind of have our finger on the pulse of what's going on in different standards. In particular, with respect to uh, interoperability and to try to coordinate um, the approaches of the different standards. And I'll talk about this a bit more uh, in a moment. Uh, another thing which we are also tasked to do is to be paying attention to standards that are outside of TADWIG and to figure out how um, TADWIG's uh, standards and vocabularies um, interface with those external standards. And that's another thing that we have dealt with several times this year. The last category of responsibilities, uh, I guess you would say is sort of like a planning function. So coordinating technical activities and maintaining a roadmap. This is something that we haven't really done, although uh, I suppose we probably should be. Um, in the past, the TAG, I think it was in 2007, developed a very detailed roadmap, which I don't think actually um, was implemented very much. So I'm a bit gun shy about feeling that we're gonna be uh, really proficient at coming up with a plan for the future of uh, Tadwig's technical activities. But um, at least in theory, we're supposed to be doing that. So of the things, that are on the list here, most of them we're actually doing except possibly this roadmap function. Um, so actually the this PowerPoint that I have here, I, I uh, sort of repurposed the one that I used at the very first meeting of the tag that I chaired, which was back in March. So with respect to meeting as an organized group that uh, has regular meetings, that that's really only been going on um, since March. So um, so anyway, the in, in March, I um, I created this PowerPoint with sort of like a, a description of the status as I saw it of some of the different um, standards, and uh, and I also presented an overview of the administrative processes of Tadwig, which I'm going to do again for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So I'm gonna talk for just a moment about like how things happen in TADWIG and where the TAG is supposed to operate within that process. So um, 
there are basically uh, four different categories of changes that happen in Tadwig standards. There are standards that are brand new, and then there are changes to existing standards. And how these are managed depends a little bit on whether uh, the voc whether these are vocabulary standards or not. So all new standards are governed by the Tadwig process, which is the fancy term for our bylaws. And if a standard is new, there isn't any group who's in charge of managing it. And so uh, there's a, in the process for developing new standards, a, a person known as a review manager is appointed to guide that process. In the case of changes to existing standards, if it's a vocabulary standard, it should have a vocabulary maintenance group. And that group then takes a, essentially the role of the review manager. So if changes are going to happen to a vocabulary, those are managed by the uh, maintenance group that's in charge of that vocabulary. For non-vocabulary standards, there's not really any process, a clear process as to how they should be handled, but they typically don't have very many changes. So uh, I guess that would be kind of ad hoc. So if you look at the similarity between these two processes, so this is the process um, on the top is uh, for the process of maintaining existing standards. And I'm not gonna go into the details except to say that um, there is a, an evaluation that's made by the maintaining uh, interest group, uh, the maintaining maintenance group to decide whether they think a change is ready to, uh, to be moved forward. And there are some criteria for that. In the case of a new standard, um, there's generally a task group that proposes it. And then that decision about whether the new uh, standard is ready to move forward or not is made by the executive committee rather than by a maintenance group. And then um, in the case of the uh, of a new standard, there are some expert reviews that happen, and then the executive committee decides whether they think that the final draft of the standard is ready for a public review. So, in the case of both a standard, a vocabulary edition that's managed by a maintenance group, and the case of a new standard, there is a place for a public review. And so, where the um, tag falls into this. First of all, um, the, as I said before, sometimes the tag is asked to look at the charters of the, inter, of the task groups themselves, which would be sort of the beginning of the process. Um, the executive can ask the um, tag to help decide whether a draft standard is complete enough to go to uh, have an, a, a review manager. And then, there's not really any special role of the tag in the review process other than that the tag is a member of the public and therefore is able to um, participate in the public review. And we have some standards that are close to this stage, so I would encourage everyone to participate in that part of it. And then finally, once the public review is finished and either the maintenance group or the review manager is satisfied that all the issues raised by the public have been dealt with, then the final version of the standard gets sent to the executive committee, which makes the final, the final decision about whether to adopt that standard or not. And if they say yes, then it either becomes a new published standard or if it's a change to an existing standard, it gets uh, implemented in the documentation. So there's two different processes, but they're they're fairly similar in the sense that there's a sort of development phase and there's a review phase, and then there's like an executive approval phase. So I'm gonna pause for just a moment here, just to see if anybody uh, has any questions about this process. And then I'll move on to talking about where we are with real live standards at this point. All right, let's talk about where we are. So um, <clears throat> the uh, so back in March, I made sort of a, a review of where we are with respect to current standards and drafts of standards and so on. And so with respect to 
new standards, um, the location of these different names of standards or proposed standards is showing you where they were in March. Um, and the arrows are showing happily the progress that those standards have made uh, since March. So um, Latimer Core, which was a draft, is now in the review standard. Plinian Core is getting close to be ready to have a review manager. Um, there has been progress made on ABCD and the ABCD uh, EFG in moving them towards the process of ratification. So that's all good news. The GGBN standard, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, continues to be stalled and probably is just gonna go out of the process. So there's been some movement and the tag has, uh, the tag or me as the chair of the tag have had some involvement in uh, helping to move these forward, which we'll talk about a little bit later. In terms of vocabulary um, extensions, coordinated extensions to vocabulary, there's a lot of exciting progress going on there. The views controlled vocabulary, which was under user testing, is now in public review, so please comment on that. The Humboldt extension has moved from a draft into the user testing phase. Uh, the how did it die task group is just waiting for the Darwin core maintenance group to approve going to public review and the material sample group um, is at the draft stage and probably going to go into some kind of user testing soon so all of these ex um, additions to existing vocabularies are also making forward process in some cases um, assisted by the tag so this is happy news because um, things tend to get stuck in Tadwig for very long periods of time. <laughs> and, and hopefully we can help grease those wheels a little bit. So um, one of the take homes from these last two slides is that things are happening in Tadwig and that's why I think the tag is um, at, is in a position to play a crucial role in helping to answer technical questions that come up related to um, these different standards that are moving through the standards or these drafts that are moving through the standards process. Uh, any questions about the current status of different things? Okay, so let's review a little bit about what we did this year. So one of the issues that came up in March was uh, there were some questions about how to document uh, XML based standards and our fearless representatives of ABCD and Plinian Core met this year and came up with a plan. So good job. And I think we're on track to, um, to uh, either bringing these to um, a review manager in the case of Plinian Core or getting them moved into the modern standard maintained by a maintenance group in the case of ABCD and EFG. So we can give, ourse give ourselves a pat in the back for that one. Uh, with respect to uh, interaction with other groups, the, um, there was some discussion at one of our meetings about the Darwin Core Mixus interoperability strategy. And I think Rice is going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so we played some role there. We had a request from the Anto Commons to have a call with them to talk about collaboration. We discussed that. That basically didn't go anywhere because uh, the ball is in their court and they seem to have dropped it. So no, uh, some discussion, but no movement there. We also had some discussion about some problems faced by the 3D task group, which we also discussed um, and didn't really come up with a solution for. So those are some of our things that some of our interactions. Um, with respect to sort of data modeling and serialization, this would be coordination across different groups within Tadwig. Um, we did at one meeting talk about how the new GBIV data model fits within Tadwig. This is really more of kind of an informative discussion about that. 
Um, there were some issues about a Tadwig wide, um, some Tadwig wide recommendations on handing, handling complex values, which has come up in Latimer Core, Humboldt extension, and is already a thing in Darwin Core. Um, so this is a sort of cross vocabularies issue. Similarly, there was some discussion about how to handle Boolean values. Um, another issue that goes across a number of different standards and those are on our agenda to talk about today. So these are some things we've been working on and uh, we'll talk about some more. Another big issue that's been discussed quite a bit over the course of the last year is identifier issues. And um, one of those is, uh, I mentioned the GTBN standard, uh, standard. That's at this point an, a standard that's external to Tadwig, it's complete. And there was discussion about bringing it into Tadwig as a Tadwig standard, but at this point, there is no uh, champion. We haven't found somebody to move that process forward. And so I think I'm, I'm proposing that we recommend today that that basically get abandoned until somebody wants to pick that up. Um, so that was partially related to identifier issues as well as some other uh, documentation issues. The big one is whether we should um, revisit the globally unique identifiers applicability statement. And that is something that we will also be talking about today. So I think that pretty much summarizes the things that we've either done or um, that we have discussed over the course of the last year. And uh, so with that, I will stop that kind of introduction and check and see if some of those of you who have not previously been to the tag have any questions about sort of what we are and what we do. All right, well, I don't see any questions popping up in the chat, so I hope that was helpful. Um, so I, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the uh, agenda with uh, Roman numeral three. And um, I'll just say that um, prior to developing this, agenda or these meeting notes, I basically went through the issue tracker <laughs> for the tag um, and decided that what I wanna do is close as many issues or close or turn into real useful issues, as many issues in the issue tracker as possible. So I'm, I'm gonna make some recommendations. The first one is there's a, an issue number 27, which was a question about, um, the DC type. We discussed this at a previous meeting and kind of threw it back to the 3D task group. And my impression is that this is a uh, kind of a difficult issue to solve. And rather than letting it hang up the progress of the task group that they may just, um, just pass by it and come back to it later if they can. So I think from the standpoint of the tag, I'm recommending that we just um, close this. And if they wanna bring it back to us again, we can, but I don't think there's really any further action that, uh, that we can make on it. So does anybody have any uh, thoughts about that? Okay, so basically with, without objection, I'm, propose, I'm going to propose that we just close that issue. Uh, in a similar vein, we have repeatedly at I think almost every meeting asked the question about what's gonna happen with GGBN. We uh, cannot find anyone thus far who um, is willing to lead the charge on that and I don't think it's gonna make any progress. And basically, I don't think there's anything else the tag can do at this point to move it forward. That's not to say that it can't move forward, it's just gonna to have to be done by somebody other than us. So I'm also going to propose that we close that issue and then uh, I, I would just communicate to the executive 
that um, we don't think it's practical to make GGBN a TADWIG standard until somebody from that community uh, steps up and is willing to, to lead that effort. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, Camilla? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree that we should close the issue. I just want to comment that we are having some GBBN course through through the ocean teacher expert because we have several projects in Colombia that are being financed by GGBN. So we have a big group of people representing GGBN in the following weeks, like Jonas Astrin, Jackie McKenzie, Katie Baker, uh, George, uh, I cannot pronounce the last name. So it should be closed, but maybe I can just come in one more time with them, our interests, well, with note, the string attached, just to commend them that we, we are trying to find that champion. Yeah, yeah. So I, just to clarify, I'm not saying that I that GGBN shouldn't be a Tadwig standard. I'm just from the standpoint of our responsibility. I don't think there's anything we can do. Um, Raisa, uh, you had a comment. Yes, also only briefly. Um, just to let you know that Katie Barker had reached out to the Gibwick interest group, which is also um, very much in connection to the GGBN standard. And we're having a meeting later this week. Um, so we'll see if anything comes out of that. And if so, I will report that back to the tag. But I do agree that without a champion, there's nothing really we can do at the moment in the tag itself. OK, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, I think what can happen is if there's motion and then somebody wants to call upon us for a review or advice, we can just create a new issue about that. So, okay, great. Uh, and and there is a, and Raisa, do you wanna take up the, the next item is about the a memorandum of understanding, which we discussed um, and you wanna report a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, thank you. Um, so uh, this is really just to let the group and everyone who's joining the meeting today know that we now have an officially signed memorandum of understanding between TADWIG and the Genomic Standards Consortium. This memorandum of understanding came out of the work of the Sustainable Darwin Core Mixes Interoperability Task Group, which was uh, or which had the main aim to bring together the two dominating standards for metadata in omics biodiversity data, which on the one hand is the Darwin Core standard, which is coming out of its history in biodiversity, and then the mixes checklist, the minimum information about any sequence checklists. And as part of the task group outputs, which also included developing a mapping and an extension to Darwin Core to know how to use that together with the mixes standard, we have now concluded that chapter for now um, by having the memorandum of understanding signed um, and I'll drop a link to that memorandum of understanding which is hosted without signatures um, for privacy reasons but the signed copies are also hosted by both um, standards organizations and by myself and Pierluigi Buriciic as the conveners of the task group um, just for anyone who's interested in what the memorandum actually states and I do think that this is an important step towards um, Tedwick um, exploring how to work with other standards that are out there that are not Tedwick standards themselves, but do prevail to very similar subjects. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for now. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, I would just like to say thank you, Raisa, and uh, to you and your group for this work. I agree with you that this is a real uh, kind of precedent setting um, uh, effort, both uh, in terms of like administratively the, the memorandum, memorandum of understanding, but also uh, I, I will just draw attention to an item that David put um, at, near the bottom about this issue of um, that came up in one of the unconference topics of about mapping between standards. So I think that this is has also provided us with a model for how that might happen. So we'll we'll talk about that more later. But uh, thank you for that work. Okay. Uh, if there are no uh, 
questions about that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on to the next item. Um, so in the previous uh, meeting, we uh, talked about the issue of coming up with a Tadwig wide uh, policy on how to represent uh, values that are essentially Boolean values. In some cases, they're explicitly um, stated to be Boolean. In other cases, they're, you know, like has so and so with a yes or no answer, but they're all, functionally they're, they're Booleans. And so um, I made sort of a proposal at the last meeting that we, we actually have a mechanism for this, which is uh, to create a, contr a SCOS controlled vocabulary. And I put a, and so I've done that. It's a very simple one. It just has basically two terms in it, but it's in the form, the same form as our other controlled vocabularies. So if you want to take a look at that, um, I think the, the key thing here, if you look at the two terms, which are true and false, is that um, it under the, in the controlled value field, there is uh, spelled out the string true and the string false in all lowercase letters, which was the recommendation that Ben had made. Um, and so if you're unfamiliar with sort of like the, um, the uh, paradigm of the Tadwig controlled vocabularies, they're modeled as SCOS. And one of the advantages of, of that is that it allows um, well, first of all, there's sort of an abstract um, IRI, language independent, um, uh, opaque IRI for each term that, that serves as basically a unique reference for that term. And then the controlled value string is basically what we recommend that people put into text-based systems like spreadsheets. But the other thing about it is that you also have the capability of creating multilingual labels. So part of, of, of using this structure is to get people used to the idea that a label is not the same thing as a controlled value string. So th this came up in a previous meeting, like wh what do we do if people put uh, vrai or faux in French or Spanish or whatever? And the, the answer to that is that's a label. That's not the controlled value string. So the controlled value string that everybody, regardless of language, should use is uh, those two recommended controlled values. So this is very simple, uh, but it's a solution that basically follows the, um, the pattern that we've used for other existing controlled vocabularies. Um, and then the other piece of the, so I guess I would say there's two other pieces of this. One, which I, is something I didn't have time to do, which would be to create some sort of like recipes document that would basically um, spell out how you would translate, uh, uh, sort of specifying how you would translate these into some of the different serialization systems that Ben uh, talked about in his uh, like white paper that, uh, that he wrote. And so rather than us prescribing this, it would really be sort of like an advice, which is like, if, if you're, if you're taking these sort of abstract values of true or false and you're translating them between uh, data storage systems or serialization systems, what, how do those map or how do those get translated? So, um, so that would, if, if this, oh, so one of the questions then is, what is the status of this? Is this something that we turn into an official standard? Is this just like a recommendation? And we can talk about that. But even if we were to adopt this as an official vocabulary, I would say that that sort of mapping recipes document would not be a normative part of that standard. It would just be um, a sort of ancillary advice, which would give us the freedom to update it freely without having to go through any kind of standards process. Uh, okay, Tim Robertson says the controlled values URIs are in English though. Okay, the URIs are not in English. The URIs are 
well they're they're not they they're ab they are uh opaque in the sense that it's you know tadwig boolean values b0 so the the local name of them doesn't it is language in b0 and b1 are just opaque strings so unlike other vocabularies where we have the local name being like an english string they're they're not the controlled value strings it's true those are english but that's the pattern that we followed in the 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 other controlled vocabularies that we have so far we've used lowercase camel case english or, or camel case english to create the controlled value strings whether that was the best way to do it or not i don't know but that's the pattern that we've been following so far far So I guess at this point, I will open this up to discussion. There's several questions. So one is, do we, do we make this an official standard control vocabulary? So like we have, I think there's three Audubon core and three Darwin core official controlled vocabularies. So there's a process for that. One of the issues is that for those controlled vocabularies, it's clear administratively that they are maintained by the Audubon core and Darwin core maintenance groups. I guess if this were an official vocabulary, the maintaining group would be the tag. There's not really a precedence for that, but I don't see why we couldn't do that. Um, the other possibility is to not make it be an official vocabulary. Um, we already have the Tadwig utility terms, which are things like ABCD equivalents and some terms like that that are used in property metadata, those are not a part of any official vocabulary. They're they're really just like for convenience. And we could so we could do that and just basically tell people, hey, this is how we want you to do it, but it's not an official um uh Tadwig vocabulary. Now, if we do that, then the question is like, where do we put these documents? Do we put them in our GitHub? Do we put them on the Tadwig website? Um, so anyway, any thoughts about that? I will say that, that part of the, the, the white paper documentation is that if you're developing, this came up with Latimer Core, that if you're developing something, whether it's a new vocabulary, a system application, whatever you want to, and you get to a, a point where it's like, I need to make a decision about how I handle this particular use case that this documentation can help you. And the white paper is a bit long, I admit, but in a sense, it, in my mind, there's a reason for that is that if make a recommendation should be able to give a full defense of it so that you at least, you know, let the person know that's looking at, okay, these guys really thought this through and this is, you know, reason one, two, three, and then that's when I can go with this or I don't have to, but it almost, it helps you move along. Right, because I can go through the recommendation, and not only that, but it's also uh, referential. It's got a link, so I could have in Latimer Core. We've come up with this that it'd be really nice to have something, and then just have a reference to the Boolean value control vocabulary, and any information, technical information, is already there. And so it's kind of a two-step process. And there are other things that are on the horizon that'll be next, like arrays, how to handle simple arrays and complex arrays, and the complex values. I know Steve mentioned a minute ago that sort of follow the same process. It won't have a control vocabulary like this does, but in the sense, it's a white paper best recommendations. It's not like a enforcement, but it's like, if you're going to build something, here's what we recommend to help you along. And this is why, you know, X, Y, and Z and so forth, um, that it should help out sort of the community, community guidance kind of documentation. And I imagine that these will start to sort of grow. So there's, the, there's a process for that or a view of that white paper, those comments, and then there's sort of like these control vocabulary processes as well. And these do set the stage for sort of going forward. It's just Boolean value is really simple, right? <laughs> it's a, it's a, you know, it's two values, right? So if you need something to start with as a boilerplate to get something going, I mean, you can't go with anything simpler than a Boolean value. So it's nice, but sort of a two prong process, if that makes sense. And the, uh, as I hope you uh, got the idea from my introduction, there's a whole lot of standards that are moving through the pipeline and getting close to coming out the other side. So part of the imperative for figuring something out here is to be able to have a consistent um, a consistent approach across these new standards rather than everybody basically coming up with their own solution. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm hopeful that we can come up co with some sort of uh, agreement about how to proceed on this. Um, David? 
Yes, um, I think Ben summarized uh, part of my position quite well. Um, I think I would like to add to this that I think for just in general uh, for those kind of recommendations, um, it it should be the default guideline for the future that when an, um, a standard is coming along and is uh, yeah using boolean terms and it's not following this that this should be like the default question why didn't you follow this and maybe they have some really valid reasons and they can can argue for it and then we can say okay that's uh, good for your special case um but yeah the the expectation would be that um yeah but the default should follow that recommendation and this leads to the just more general question how do we handle um uh yeah those things in, in general. So um, if we have recommendations for the tech and say, okay, this is how certain th things should be said, then um, I think it's, it's uh, quite useful to have a general category for TEDRIC recommendation or TEDRIC tech recommendation, uh, where we can put all of those different documents both on the website and then also in the GitHub as well. But just having it as an auxiliary document to a meeting is not sufficient here. And um, But on the other hand, I don't think that the control to carry in particular should be a dedicated uh, um, yeah, vocabulary with all of the maintenance processes. But uh, maybe I'm just a bit too, too practical on that approach and say, OK, just put it in the, in the TEDVIC utilities um, and then have the the official recommendation document um, as yes a way of saying okay this is how we expect you to do this in the future. So I think there's you know one option would be to just create a folder in the GitHub site and put stuff in there, but it sounds like you are thinking create like a, something more findable on the actual Tadwig website. I'd concur with that. Having a page of this kind of documentation as we sort of collected along and post it there once it, you know, it could go the white, this is for the white paper side of it. I mean, if you have a white paper, somebody submits it in a meeting and then everybody goes and reviews it. And then in two meetings going forward, please make comments to this. And then there's a meeting to sort of review those comments and then it's set and then it gets put on the Tadwick website as a, you know, and there's as a best practice guide or however you want to, David, you heard it better than that. Um, however you want to put it. And just have it there and this would be separate from the control vocabulary part of boolean although you'd connect these two and but arrays would go along with the white paper sort of section of the website but we need a couple to post i think i mean just one isn't really at least two you know we, we, yeah we and i've started certainly... writing the arrays one actually but i just haven't gotten very far with it you know? yeah uh, i guess we can certainly turn the the s small presentation we gave on um documenting xml standards uh, according to the sds and turn this also into some kind of recommendation paper that would fit in there as well. Yeah, I just threw into the chat, um, you know, the Audubon core um, had some discussion about like basically policies and the, the solution we did was to just go to the Audubon core GitHub site and create a policies page. <laughs> we only have one policy so far. I mean, <laughs> I, I guess the difference between putting it in our GitHub repository and the website is a question of how easy is it, how um, agile is it in those two places and how likely is it that people will know where to look. So I guess one of the things is in, in my mind, if I wanted to find out something about the tag i'd go to the tag github site that's where we list all of our members and stuff like that um if it goes into the tadwig website then every time we want to change something we have to you know there has to be a pull request and somebody has to approve it and probably take six months to figure out like where it should be put in the website and so it's just kind of i, I guess creating a section of our GitHub repository where we uh, archive documents and policies um, would be the easy way out, but I'm not sure from the perspective of somebody who isn't aware of the work of the tag, like how would they discover it? 
right? If you're a collection manager, you're adding a field to your collection database, and I want to see how are they handling true false values. If it's something like a web page, I could go to where I could see that kind of stuff, I'm sort of helping make decisions within the greater community. But I can you see the, the workflow is a little longer, but still. Yeah. Go ahead, Yuda. Um, so I've, I'm pretty new to the process, but when I go um, to Tadvik to find information, I actually go to the website and look there first. GitHub is for me a bit vague, like not very, I can't really get a good overview. Um, so would it be possible to have like on the web page and a general um, page or category of like these are recommendations or yeah be best practices or so and that would then point to to github steve it's got to be a web page <laughs> yeah say, we, we well, i think pages, you know what I, mean? I guess the i guess the maybe what we need to do is talk to the i don't know process group or who, whoever it is who manages the web page i mean i think it needs to be at a fairly high level in the navigation hierarchy. If it just gets buried as like a sub page under the tag, you know, to get to the tag page, you have to do like, I forget what it is, about and then tag. And then, I, I mean, like, I'm not sure anybody would find it. I think it would need to be a fair, fairly high level in the navigation hierarchy. But I think there would be a potential for putting a number of useful things there. So maybe I can discuss that with um, with uh, the people who are managing the website. So I'm just looking at the site very quickly here, and perhaps it could go on the standards page if we create a section on that page for controlled vocabularies or something like that. Yeah, now the thing about the controlled vocabularies does are because they're associated with particular standards. Like if you go to any of the Darwin Core or Audubon Core pages, at the top of the menu on those pages, there is like a drop down, and, and those controlled vocabularies are listed along with like the general vocabulary for that standard. So they sort of already have, I mean, I guess maybe a section on policies or recommendations or something like that. Uh, I, I guess I just wouldn't frame it as controlled vocabularies, but more as a um, like uh, best practices or something like that section. Um, all right, well, I, I, I think there seems to be a consensus. It should go somewhere prominently on the website. I don't think we need to work out what that is right now in the interest of time. Um, and I also seem to get the feeling that it, that people feel it's not necessary that this controlled vocabulary become an official part of any standard. Is that correct? Thumbs up about that. Okay. I, I think that gives us a level of agility, uh, not that this is going to change a lot, but, uh, I, I, I feel okay about that. Cool. Okay, so um, with respect to what still needs to be done, I, I think, um, I guess, Ben, you and I can work on um, trying to draft, uh, you know, kind of recipes and then yeah. finish cleaning up your white paper. And then yeah. I think we could bring it back to the group before we uh, do anything official with respect to posting it. And have a template sort of format for things, you know, going forward, that kind of thing. Just yes. the process and put something together. That sounds good. Cool. Okay. Well, if people are comfortable with that, then uh, let's move on to our next weighty issue here, which is the um, globally unique identifier. So there's several issues in our tracker that are ancient that involve uh, taking some rather drastic actions, um, at least in theory, being asked by the executive committee to do this. <clears throat> at this point, these issues are so old, and I don't think there's anybody on the executive committee now who was on the executive, or few people who were on the executive committee when these were 
things were actually asked of us. So I guess what I would like to do would be to just close those issues and then reopen an issue that says what it is that we are actually planning to do as a group. And we've discussed this over a number of meetings and, I, and I'd like to kind of come to a consensus about what task, uh, what path we should take. And I, I sort of uh, outlined three options here. One is to formally, formally convene a task group to update the Global Unique Identifiers Applicability Statement. Uh, the second option would be to create some documents that, uh, and, and this would be sort of along the lines of what we just discussed, uh, best practices or current practices documents. These would be things that are not uh, a, an actual standard, but that are kind of like a, an explanation of a, a practical advice about identifiers. And perhaps put in a few notes about for example, the fact that although they are not deprecated, the LSIDs are not actually widely um, used. So, well, okay, that's maybe not even true. Padwig is no longer recommending them as like the way to go or however we wanna state that. So anyway, this, the second choice is to do something less than a full revision, but to create some doc explanatory documentation about the current status of things. And then the third option would be, be to just say like, this isn't our problem. We're closing the issues and somebody will bring it back to us when it's a problem. <laughs> so those are, I guess, the options. And I would love if we could come to some consensus on this. And uh, I, I guess I'd start by inviting Ian you put some uh, notes in here. Uh, would you like to speak a little bit about your thoughts about this? Mm, yeah, sure. So I think what I said in the note is that I would um, be happy to organize a meeting, a separate meeting from this um, from this tag committee to look at that. Um, you know, with the people that are interested. We've been talking about it quite a lot, but we haven't quite got that traction to get something going. And so I'd be happy to try and facilitate that a little bit if if I can and if um, the other group members think that's the right way to go. I, I think that would constitute convening a task group, having such a meeting. So I don't want to be the convener. I, I think somebody needs to, um, you know, we need, I think we need to have a good convener, the right person as sort of taking that more official role. Um, if we decide in a meeting like that, that a task group is the way that we want to go. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, I, I'm happy just to kind of play the administrative role of organizing that meeting. Walter? Yeah, there are uh, several um, bit policies uh, in existing now, for instance, the one in, in EOSC in, in Europe, uh, and there's several national ones as well. Uh, I think it would be a good idea if, um, if, that we could also uh, endorse uh, a, a bit policy uh, for for persistent identifiers. Uh, I think that's what uh, what actually is needed right now. Uh, and maybe we need a task group or um, um, a, a group of meetings to uh, to get to that. Tim. I would just uh, agree with uh, Wouter. I think that would be a good output for Tadwig to come out with a, a PID policy. Um, it does need a champion, though, to lead a task group, I think. Well, it seems to me like we do have a path forward here in the sense that Ian, although not agreeing to serve as convener, uh, is offering to uh, uh, convene a meeting to discuss 
the potential formation of a task group. I think that's a that would be a good um, step. And we do have a rather lengthy list in our previous notes of potential participants. And and certainly anyone attending this meeting right now would be welcome to participate. So I would. So I guess I would feel happy about just closing those three issues, opening a new issue, saying that this is what we're going to do, that uh, Ian is going to organize a meeting to take place early in 2023 uh, to come to some conclusion about potentially forming a task group. Does that sound good? All right, well, without objection, I'm I'm going to consider that to be a suitable course of action. I'm seeing various thumbs up. So Ian, kudos to you for, um, for agreeing to uh, at least moving this into the next stage, whatever that is. Okay, great. Uh, awesome, and there's some, uh, Rod, did you, have any, did you have anything you wanted to say? I noticed you put a note in the document. Not really, just, just to remind people that LSIDs are a thing and they exist and there are a few of us who still want to make them resolvable. That was just purely the point of that. Yeah, I was trying to be careful not to say we should say that they're deprecated. <laughs> so, Jim. So we, we run the resolvers for LSID at GPIF and we'll continue to do so, Rod. Um, Unless we get a champion for them in Tadwick, though, it's going to be wow. difficult to, to sort of make any decisions around it. And other than you, um, and possibly the, the folks from Q, we're not hearing um, much, much need for them. Would you like to be the champion for LSIDs? To, we'll, we'll support <laughs> you at GBIF, but they're not things that we use. We just run the resolvers. Well, I think, uh, how about this, Rod, would you attend Ian's meeting <laughs> and potentially participate? Because I, 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 although I frame this as uh, revising the GUID applicability statement, I, I should say that both that and the LSID uh, applicability statement are actually both part of the same standard. And they're two documents within the same standard. And I would say that uh, feeling, figuring out how to deal with both of them could fall within the purview of any uh, group. Yeah, um, happy to take part. Um, I'm not necessarily thinking of being a champion. I just want people to realize that they do exist and there is a community of people who minted them and use them. So there's probably, you know, 10 to 15 million of these things kicking around. Um, I, do, I do like the idea of a clean start though, like a paired applicability statement. Um, sounds like a sensible way forward. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, let's see, we're down to a half hour left. And let's, so let's, so thanks, Ian, and I will leave it up to you to organize a meeting. Um, great. Let's talk about complex values. So um, this, I would say the genesis of this is that some conversations Ben and I have been having about um, particularly values that are like um, JSON arrays. However, I, I'm uh, attending or participating in a number of different groups and a sort of broader version of this has come up in several different contexts. Most recently in the um, Humboldt Extension Group uh, the, the issue there was, I guess, a, a different sort of complexity in values. In that situation, there were um, separate terms for like a, a measurement and the units associated with that measurement. And if a record has only one value for each of those, then, it, then clearly they're associated. Associated. The problem is, though, if you have then two values, then you don't know which unit goes together with which value. This is similar to um, some of the other um, 
like there's some ad hoc solutions for this in Darwin Core, like the um, uh, what's it called dynamic properties and uh, and stuff like that. So it, the the problem of having multiple values and how you deal with them, particularly in like flat spreadsheets, is something that keeps coming up and has had, I would say, a range of of kind of uh, kludgy um, solutions. And so one question is, do we want to come up with something less kludgy, more elegant, and recommend it? Uh, in the same way that we're talking about recommending how people handle Booleans. So this is a bit more complicated than Booleans, but I feel for, for the same reason that we have a number of standards that are close to coming out of the pipeline and potentially suggesting multiple different solutions to this problem, I think this would be a place where if we can come up with some sort of recommendations that could be followed, um, Tadwig wide that it would be great, but it's 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 a more complicated issue than the uh, the Booleans issue. So I tried to uh, took about a half a day <laughs> to try to create this document for um, what I thought were sort of the existing precedents, and then to throw together some of the use cases that people um, that I'm aware of. So I guess. The, the first question is like, is this something that we should be doing? And if the answer to that is yes, then how do we move forward on it? So I, I will just open this up to discussion at this point. And, and Ben, you're one of the key uh, proponents of doing something here. So if you wanna comment beyond what I said, that'd be awesome. Sure, a lot of this has Traditionally, most of these you know, data transfer files, the way people have shared things in flat file spreadsheets, but obviously flat file spreadsheets have limitations. And, and the simplest example I have is the vernacular names. If you've got one species with multiple vernacular names, you not only do you have multiple vernacular names, but each one of those vernacular names may have a property of language and is it the primary vernacular name, for example. And you sort of these nested, and JSON is very easy, right? Just a nested structure, a nested array. But, but then it becomes, how do you handle that within CSV files and how do we handle that across the board. And, and it's becoming more and more prevalent as more people are sort of pushing away from sort of these flat files because you just have a comma separate value list, right? But as we go more and more, we're having more and more nesting of these more complex data structures. And so the question is, how do we handle these across the board? And Latimer requires a couple of these. And there's several types of arrays that we've come up with. And so the other idea is that this will be sort of a white paper that will sort of somewhat like Boolean values, except won't be a control vocabulary, more be how to address each one of these particular use cases. And there are a lot of them, but it, it really needs, because it goes to the heart of, of how data is structured and how you know you sort of handle particular use cases, that it's really important that we these get addressed in a more uniform fashion. Um, that that's, it, it's key. And so it, it is needs to be broken down, I think a little clearer as well, if I articulate this a little better. And I think examples would help too. Um, but I think it is something that needs to be addressed on a wider, I think a tag is, is great, you know, well suited for that. Yeah, uh, and, and James has put a question in the chat. Have we looked beyond the other communities for best practice? It seems to me that this is a global issue and someone much, must have addressed this. I would just comment that I think within at least like the W3C that there are some, I guess, maybe evolving practices. And, I, you know, what comes to mind first for me is the um, IIIF standard W3, well, actually it's not a W3C standard. It's not actually, it's an independent body, but, um, and the difference there though, is they have one particular serialization. They basically, this is basically a specification for um, web servers and clients. And there's an expectation that it's going to be JSON LD. So that, as Ben noted, J there's no problem expressing these kind of complex, um, you know, nested values in JSON and and or in JSON LD, which is a, a flavor of JSON. But in Tadwig, we have, you know, these multiple systems. We have XML, we have JSON, we have 
spreadsheets, we have relational databases. And, you know, so we're, we hesitate from specifying particular implementation systems, you know, in things like, like Darwin Core, where they're very, um, like, sort of vague bag of terms, and the implementation is handled at on like another layer. So, you know, if we were, if we were all using JSON for everything, I think this would have like a fairly simple solution. But the question is, how do we handle this when when we don't have one? And then, of course, RDF is another thing, RDF and linked data, which is something that's uh, repeatedly come up as an interest, but not like widely implemented uh, in production systems. And, and I wish that uh, that Rob was here. I don't think he is here today because I'm sure he would have some thoughts about that. I would just say that to me as a non-developer and non-database manager, that the idea of putting JSON in a spreadsheet cell seems like a pretty um, simple solution to this, but whether that whether that's a good idea or not, I don't know. I mean, it is what the dynamic properties uh, uh, property in Darwin Core does. I see John Wajorek is here. <laughs> John, do you have any thoughts about dynamic properties? Do people use that a lot and how does it work? Uh, how uh, well does it work? Hear me, I'm in a coffee shop. I'll give it my best and quickly. Uh, the change in the recommendation to dynamic properties to use JSON snippets was because there was too much variability in what was going in before. Dynamic properties does get used and it's one of the only ways to carry along information that doesn't have a home elsewhere. So it's a good thing to have. Um, it's if it's formatted correctly, it's also slightly more useful than any other solution before it because it allows for key value pairs and lists and dictionaries a whole nine yards. Um, so, so far, aside from people not actually following the example of using JSON to format dynamic properties, there have been no reported problems. So I think it's a net positive. So, so it sounds like per se, the approach of putting JSON in a spreadsheet cell isn't necessarily a bad idea. And then I guess the question would be, can we come up with recipes for uh, recurring use cases? So like, I, I think the simple one is just a list, but then what Ben mentioned, this the situation where you have a list of vernacular names, each of which has, you know, a, a language and a string and so on. I think that's similar to the the Humboldt extension use case where you have um, where you have the um, values and units that need to be kept together. Would it be helpful to come up with some examples? To have like there's this use case and you could you could look at it what the situation is and then have some sort of recommendations below it of where things are thinking would that be helpful yeah i mean i i have the that in the use cases document i did put some examples in there that i could think of uh, it's in the yeah. notes i see um i mean like if we make a recommendation we would definitely want to have some kind of recipes or examples james so i just wanted to say that I think we have to be conscious of where and how most of this data is captured, right? It's coming in through collection management systems uh, or spreadsheets. And those are only as good as, you know, what they allow in, in a given field. And they're only as good as the documentation and best practices implemented in a particular institution. And of course we can translate them, you know, parse them and such, if there is some kind of standard <laughs> separators used within those fields, right? So it, we could reinterpret them in JSON if they were done in a particular way that makes our life easy. 
uh, when we share them. But so it strikes me that, you know, whatever we do here, and I agree that we need some kind of best practice, it really has to push down to those users. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's about, yeah, it's about the people who are actually typing this stuff in. Yeah, I mean, I think that the place where this is coming out most directly is in some of the new, you know, like Latimer Core, uh, the Humboldt extension, and and even in um, Audubon Core with the um, regions of interest where you have multiple regions of interest within an image is, is also a similar use case. And so it, it, these are all relatively new things. So it's not like we have years of people doing some other kind of hack. And I think that's why there's an opportunity for us if we can come up with some kind of consistent recommendations that the, you know, if somebody develops a script to take um, relational data and create JSON to put in a cell that gets sent up in a Darwin Core archive or something, I think that this would be a great time to, to figure that out <laughs> before these uh, standards that are nearing the end of the pipeline actually come out with each of their own independent solutions. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think I'll step back and say, hey, well, there's two sides to this then. You know, in the sense of defining a uh, location on an image, of course, the script can run and it can format it in whatever way we think is best. Uh, but in the case of the vernacular names that Ben's example, those are likely going to be typed in by humans on some, you know, text blob. Uh, and so the challenge is different there. And so I guess we need to make sure we hit both the, the, the scripters, you know, that the, the um, even the developers and the inputters who are, you know, students. And we've also had discussions about how to name them as well. So in that, because if vernacular name is a class, then the term that would be the parent of the array is has vernacular name and has indicates it has this particular class. And then that what gets nested is the is uh, the actual class properties. And so that's how you sort of structure it. So it's almost like it's everything. It's how you structure the actual you know object itself, how you do the term, and then vernacular names is already part of uh, Darwin Course. So there's an there's a there's a catch there, and that's not what's going on. Latin records different, but um, it's the whole how you handle them all together that's sort of coming up together. But how you do that because it is a term, but it's it's a term that has multiple properties, right? It's a class unto itself. I, I would say to James's point, I have done this approach as a hack in some Python scripts that I've written. And it's a real pain in the neck to try to get the uh, commas and the quotation marks and everything to be valid JSON typing them in by hand. So, you know, particularly anything more complicated than like a list wh where you have, uh, you know, uh, nested dictionaries or whatever, I do think there would be a some serious potential problems. On the other hand, I also think maybe, I don't know, maybe we have a lot of smart people who can build tools. <laughs> maybe there's a tool to do it. So I have a, I have a question. This, this problem stems from the desire to put all this information in a single file because I mean, often what you do is you create a second file. Like if you look at vernacular names in Darwin Core, in, in a Darwin Core archive, they would show up as a separate file. They wouldn't, you wouldn't try to put them in the, in the taxon table. As, just yeah, as a requirements I mean, question. I, I think once it gets complicated enough, then the new GBIV model, which allows for more complex linking of classes than the star schema allows, maybe that just comes into play. So, I mean, I think the, the, the use of this is probably for the cases that are the simplest, where it would make sense to put something simple in a cell. Once you, if you start getting a, a really complicated structure, then, then you just need to have another, basically another table. So, you know, I guess maybe part of the charge of, of 
developing some recommendations on this would be how complicated, how simple or how complicated is it appropriate to take this kind of approach? And there are rules as well. As if, if a term is an array and it has nothing, do you, if for example, if a species does not have any vernacular names, for example, do you just have an empty array? And I would say yes. So there are rules and practices within there. They're not just about you know file transfer. It's also about how you handle them. Period. Um, they go in sort of a white paper best practice document um, that the terms almost require, but it can be an empty array, but it's still an array. It's always an array if you have this particular thing. Those kind of detailed rules. Um, okay, well, we are, we're, we're burning up most of our time here. So I guess I would um, just kind of call the question here with respect to, is this something we should continue to work on? It, it seems like from what people are saying, this is an act, this is a problem. And if we can come up with a solution, that would be a valuable thing, although it's not apparent exactly what the boundaries are of the problem and what the solution is at this point. Uh, but is there a consensus? Is that true that this is something we should work on productively? James? Sorry, oh, I hit that's the a thumbs uh, up. Yeah, I hit the wrong <laughs> button. Okay, any other thumbs up? Okay. Uh, all right, I see enough thumbs up that we can at least carry this forward on a, a, into the future. Uh, okay, before we run out of time, I do want to make sure that we get to the um, the remainder of the items on here. So one of the things that is actually, it looks like three old issues is requests by the... Um, the executive committee to do some kind of review of old standards. Uh, this isn't the first thing that I brought up in March as a burning problem because it's sort of like leaving sleeping dogs lie. Um, I think it would probably be so there just as background. Tadwig standards can be divided into different groups. There's like current standards. There's 2005 standards, there is prior standards, which are the old ones. And then there's a category which has not been used so far, which is uh, retired standards. Um, and just to give you an example of this, one of the standards, uh, the X, uh, what is it? X, uh, not XSD, I forget what it is, X something uh, standard was actually lost. <laughs> Nobody had a copy of it. Uh, and actually Paco Pondo found a copy of it last week and it's now been posted. But clearly this is a standard that almost nobody uses and probably XFD, thank you, David. Uh, anyway, so that would be a potential candidate for retiring. Now, what exactly does it mean to retire a standard? That's also not clear. I guess it's sort of like saying, no, nobody is maintaining this and Therefore, it's probably not a good idea for you to put a bunch of effort into using it because nobody else is using it. I guess that's sort of what a retired standard might be. So one of our possible tasks would be to go through uh, and, you know, I don't know, split up the old standards. There's about, I don't know what, 10 or 15 of them and try to figure out like, what's their current state, who's using them, some of them, like index for variarum is actually being maintained as a product by somebody else. So that's clearly not going to go away. Do we continue to call that a Tadwig standard? Um, so I don't know. I, I don't see this as a burning issue, but if we, uh, it is something we could take up. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, David. Um, I would like to make one distinction to what you just said. Um, you created, uh, created um, um, the, the it's standard being not maintained anymore and not being used anymore. 
And while this is usually the same, it's not necessarily. So there could be that standard just isn't maintained anymore because of the all of the people who were active in the, in the maintenance group just went away. Uh, but it actually is still used at places, just in its current form. And whereas I think a, re, um, a good point for retirement of a standard should be when it's not used anymore. Uh, okay, that's a great distinction. Thanks. I guess my feeling would be this is this would be a useful thing to do if we're not busy doing other things. <laughs> so maybe we should just leave it at that. And I, I might just combine these issues into one issue and close the other ones in the interest of making the issue tracker smaller. Uh, I'm going to skip over the anthropo anthropological cultural issues and the SCOS XL one. I don't think that there is a uh like a person pushing these so uh, and i do want to go on to roman numeral eight one is um please comment on the views controlled vocabularies it's in the public comment period until the end of the month so um that would be valuable to get input on that um also with respect to I mentioned that we have sort of a limit of 15 members. Uh, if you're one of the members and I don't hear from you, I'm going to assume that means you're fine with staying on. I have had one person tell me they're going to step down. So there's going to be at least one new slot if somebody wants to officially come in. So if you want to step off or step in, um, please communicate that with me. Um, I'm asking basically a one-year commitment uh, and the meetings are bi-monthly for an, an hour. So it's not a huge lift, but um, anyway, let me know. Um, okay, I wanted to make sure we got to C, which is um, the standards mapping unconference group. David, do you wanna um, to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, really quick. So at the TEDWIC, we had the unconference slot on Friday, and uh, I suggested for that um, to talk about mappings between standards. This has been a topic that has come up a couple of times during the TEDWIC and is general a topic uh, um, that has, yeah, um, touches every standard more or less. And so I suggested that, and there was quite a response. We were the largest of the conference breakout groups. Uh, we are 15 people, I think. And um, in the beginning, I gave a bit of an introduction based on the work we had um, with the Darwin Core ABCD alignment group two years ago, there we had a breakout group for mappings and we looked at certain issues and regarding the mappings in general. And then there's this uh, one mapping standard, SSS SOM, um, which I only heard about, I haven't used it, but I thought, okay, this could have potential to look at it. Um, I didn't stay for the entire time of the session because I had to leave early to catch the plane, but the others continued to discuss and there is now um, a Slack channel in the regular TEDWIC, uh, not in the, the TEDWIC 2022, but the, the regular uh, TEDWIC Slack working space, that's the correct term, has now a channel for mappings between standards. There I put a couple of notes on the, on the introduction if you want to see yeah, what I talked about. Um, yeah, just check it out there. And then um, Holly mentioned that um, towards the end, there was also the idea to use the, the paleo group as an um, example to, to yeah, look into those mappings. Um, Holly, do you want to say a couple of words or? Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I can add, we were just kind of discussing what would actually be needed from the mappings. Um, I obviously have a lot of interest in figuring out some of the paleo stuff, so we talked about that a bit, uh, but that it would be an interesting use case because there's more work within a bunch of different standards to better understand how fossils map to them, so it could help highlight some uh, interesting problem areas or areas of work. Um, and I, I don't know if David was going to mention this, but we talked about what kind of group was needed to do this work a bit more as well. Yeah. So, um, which is also kind of why 
both of us independently thought that this would make a good fit for um, for the tech um, uh, to to put this under some kind of umbrella here. Um, but I think we can have the full discussion about this maybe at the next meeting, considering the time for now. I just wanted to let you know that this meeting had happened. There's a lot of interest also in the group, already a lot of members. Um, so this is certainly a topic that yeah, somehow needs to be uh, addressed and um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely this is, uh, is an area of interest and uh, as I mentioned when Raisa was talking earlier, uh, you know, there's been some very concrete work done on this already. So I think the real issue would be, is there a champion <laughs> or a group of people who would be willing? I mean, it's not necessary to have a single convener. There are task groups that have multiple conveners, but if, if there is enough interest to charter a task group, I think it's been determined that the TAG can charter task groups. It's, it certainly has chartered task groups in the past. And I think this would be a good place for that. So uh, I guess I would encourage people who are interested in this to talk with others and find out potential core members who might participate and who, who might be a potential convener. And then uh, I, I do feel like that would be a worthwhile task group for us to, to um, to charter, and then it would be in their hands to um, to move that forward. Um, any thoughts about that? Sounds good. Kind of a homework until the next uh, meeting. Yeah. Okay. So we'll talk about this more at the next meeting. Between now and then, um, you know, ask around for potential participants. They don't have. I mean. Task group members don't have to be participants in the umbrella parent group or whatever. So it doesn't have to be somebody here today. It could be really anybody who's interested in that problem. Okay, we have like one more minute. Um, I see the old tag mailing list. I don't think anybody uses the Tadwig email list anymore. I still post to it and I think there are still people on it, but I don't think anybody knows about it or how to get onto it. So it seems like, I don't know, seems like people want to use Slack. <laughs> Is that true? We don't really have a, I, I guess Slack is our default communication system. At least that's what people said at the first meeting they wanted to use. So I would say maybe just ignore it. <laughs> um, and then I see about ABCD incompatibility. I think we, I think this is something we have talked about and is in progress, right, David? Like handling EFG along with our ABCD reboot, yeah, it, right? That's already it, on the agenda. That 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 particular uh, issue was raised by Sam, and we had a couple of emails prior. Uh, so we are aware of this and uh, might put this into discussion at the uh, ABCD interest group meeting in half an hour. So um, I'm not quite sure okay. who wrote it in the minutes here. Um, whether this is uh, uh, Sue has already left and uh, Walter has already left. So the the, the other naturalist people. Um, Maybe some of them put it in here. I don't know, um, but we can. Uh, we might just look, look at this uh, in half an hour or in the meeting in half an hour. Okay, great. Well, we are out of time, and I thank you so much for uh, for those of you who haven't participated before. Thanks for coming. I hope that uh, that you've learned some more about the group and our work. And I would encourage you, if you're interested, to continue to partic participate because as I said, anyone is uh, welcome. So thanks everybody. And uh, I guess at this point we'll stop the recording and, uh, and